so hello um, everybody. Um, good morning, good evening, and I guess everything um, in between, uh, wherever you are. I, I hope you're, I hope you're well. Um, Sam and Tom have um, presented two really interesting um, kind of discussions on this topic of collective memory. And I thought as the historian, we've had lots of um, references throughout to, to the past. And so in this sort of final reflection, I thought fittingly, I would go um, back to, to first principles and think a little bit more expansively about this idea of collective memory and its connection to um, to fashion. And I think this is a really appropriate time to be having this discussion as we are beginning, I think, I hope, to be emerging from the uh, sort of ravages of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, albeit at different paces around the world. Um, we are, I think, beginning to reflect on that collective experience, aren't we, in terms of how the pandemic has affected our lives, the lessons we've learned from it or, or, or should be learning from it over the past 12 months um, and more. And I think this sense almost of, of unity in distress is, is fittingly um, conveyed, I think, by one object um, in particular, and it's an object that um, links uh, most of us um, around the world, and that is, of course, the, the face mask. And if you think about it, it's quite extraordinary to have one object, uh, one item of cultural production, whether, whether dress or um, otherwise, that unites so many of the people around the world at one moment in time. But as much then as some of our kind of collective experiences and, and memories or indeed nightmares might be linked to the pandemic and, and what the, the face mask means to us, I think the face mask is also a kind of neat um, device or, or, or dress accessory that also tells us something else that we're, we're learning um, about the pandemic, namely that although we have collectively experienced it, the nature of that experience, the nature of the impact of the pandemic has been hugely differential. So as we're beginning to kind of grapple with those collective experiences, whether we're using the term collective memory, whether we're kind of cognizant of that or not, um, we're beginning, as I said, to think a little bit more about this differential impact and how we're going to, to deal with it. And I think it's not not for me surprising, and, and probably for many of you listening, that, that fashion should be very much the sort of instances, the, the sort of epicenter of this sort of vortex of, of, of swirling ideas and debates. Um, obviously, we can think about the visual immediacy of the clothes that we wear, but also their intimate um, connections to us in terms of our, our, our lived experiences. And I just want to share, um, I, by way of contextualization, just some um, examples of the different cultural and historical debates and discussions that are going on around the world as we sort of contemplate that differential impact of the um, pandemic and think about cultural issues that have become more important um, as a result of the um, events of the last sort of 12 months. Um, so we can think, for example, if we look to the um, bottom left of your screen, um, reports on people's faith becoming more important, people going um, to, to church more frequently. Um, this is an article from the New York Times, but thinking about um, the increase of church going in France. That idea of tapping into cultural and collective experiences to kind of galvanize our resolve during a time of disquiet. If Catholicism is referenced in this article is not quite your thing, an article above that from last week's Financial Times suggested that people are dabbling in, in, in um, tarot and rediscovering that. Quite a different set of um, values and beliefs to um, those of the Catholic Church, but still that kind of, I think, continual theme of understanding our role in um, relation to long-standing ideas, memories, um, uh, and institutions. But as much as those two examples, the idea of faith and, and, and belief, can demonstrate perhaps how collective memory um, might be galvanizing and, and reassuring, as I said, the 
um, uh, disparity that the pandemic has revealed has also, I think, made us sort of wrestle with the fact that our collective memories are also complex and reveal that these iniquities of the present have been long-standing. Um, so if we look to the um, bottom right of your screen, debates about the restitution of the Benin bronzes, particularly in the UK and in Germany, but demonstrating that those issues of racial inequality, um, which are um, increasingly urgent um, today, but are long-standing, um, and more broadly, the very notion of, of what culture is and, and what history is and what history should be are, are increasingly being questioned. And, and some commentators suggesting that culture and, and history are, are maybe becoming um, obsolete. And I think a neat distillation of all of these different ideas about cultural and collective memory um, distilled, I think, last weekend in the funeral um, in the UK of the, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, here, um, center of your screens, an article by Robin Givan suggesting that um, ritual, again, has this galvanizing impact, particularly during times of, of distress. It can be something of a psychological solve to make us feel that we're, we're part of something larger um, than ourselves. Here, of course, tapping into the, the ideas of the institution of monarchy. But as much as um, Givan's piece was maybe a um, encouraging and, and perhaps largely positive um, presentation of, of the continuing role of, of monarchy and the ideas and memories that it evokes, interesting that sort of running alongside that, another dialogue saying that where we find ourselves right now, these collective memories, ideas, associations of monarchy are, are, are now worn out. Um, and a lot of people, of course, linking um, that sort of the idea that, that monarchy and its ideas are perhaps becoming moribund to the recent um, interview um, with the Duke and Duchess of, uh, of Sussex. And again, not surprising, I think, that within this kind of context, all these sort of swirling ideas and debates, that fashion should really find itself at the, um, at the centre. Um, so um, one story here from the end of, of last month and actually linking to a question that was asked about issues of, of sort of sustainability. Um, here, um, an article talking about the use of old clothes or um, old materials, or, or old cloth being used in the construction of new garments. So that idea that the past and its associations, um, maybe the comfort or the legitimacy that it provides through a series of collective um, associations, perhaps a little bit like um, those that um, um, Sam was talking about, um, helping to kind of galvanize an issue that is, is pressing in the present, namely issues of, of sustainability. Um, or even um, this example from this morning's um, Financial Times, a, a full page um, advertisement from, from Mulberry, so um, a leather goods maker um, based here in the UK. Um, and I think this is for me really quite interesting. It, it starts off, um, talking about how Mulberry is 50 years old. So again, using that kind of trope of history and, and age kind of legitimizing um, this brand and, and the use of heritage. And we all know, of course, that that's not new in, in, in sort of fashion marketing. But I think interesting that it, it, it's another um, um, piece that talks about sort of sustainability, the idea that the, the leather um, that the bag is made from is uh, responsibly sourced and that this is a bag that you can carry with you throughout your life because it's been sort of so well made and, and as I said, responsibly made, that you can um, sort of carry it with you as, as you are beginning to make your own life stories. So it can be part of, of the memories um, that you make in your, um, in your life um, cycle. And so in both of these sort of articles, one obviously peddling product, the other a little bit more reflective, but, but sort of tapping into a word that, you know, I find um, I'm coming across a lot more of late in advertising copy and also in um, sort of journalistic commentaries, namely sort of nostalgia, this idea again that um, in a time which is full of 
uh, remorse and, and recriminations because of sort of social, political and, uh, and economic um, dislocation, the past and, 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 and the memories that maybe it that, that, that comes to mind um, can galvanize, can provide that sense of, of psychological solve. Um, and I think as Tom mentioned, it, the interesting fact that we have um, for the first time in, in our global history, seven sort of generations all in the, in, in the mix together. And as we are through those um, generational um, groupings, trying to make sense of our present. I don't think for me as a historian, it's a surprise that the past is being used or, or the past is having this sort of resurgence as we begin to question who we are, what are we, um, what should we be, as, as I said, we emerge from the, the pandemic or that, that fashion should be very much at the sort of forefront of those, of those dialogues. So this is, I suppose, a roundabout way of talking about the important connection between fashion on the one hand and, and collective memory on the other. Um, what do I mean by collective um, memory? And so quite literally just a sort of one liner to give you a sort of sense of, of where I'm coming at this term from. Um, by using this concept, I'm thinking about how our identities, our values and expectations, our behaviors are shaped by the socialized norms of the community or, or communities of which we form part. And I think it's interesting to sort of pause and reflect that although the term collective memory um, was current in the 19th century, this, this phrase as we use it today was very much crystallized during the 1930s um, by Morris Hogwerk, um, a social scientist, and by Abby Vorberg, an art historian. Um, and for me, the 1930s is, is really kind of crucial here. You know, if we think about that period, the 1920s, the 1930s. Um, this was, um, you know, a, a time when the world was recovering from the ravages of the First World War. Also, of course, another pandemic, that of 1918 and 1919, and also taking a kind of a weary breath before the onslaught of the Second World War. So I, it's not, I think, surprising to me that it was during this period of, again, social, economic and political dislocation that there was this sort of resurgence and this sort of perhaps nostalgic, but an idea of looking back to past of collective memories to help us sort of navigate um, our way. And I'm not seeking to draw a kind of simple causality between the 1930s and the present, but I would just say it's interesting to observe that during another period of pronounced unease and disquiet, this concept and idea of, of collective memory again seems to find uh, uh, traction. And I think it's useful. Collective memory is a very expansive term. In some ways, it, it's problematic. Collective implies homogeneity that we are all, all alike. We know we're not. Memory also maybe implies something that is immutable, that it's of the past and maybe kind of now somewhat irrelevant. Um, and that's something that I, I want to, to challenge in, in what I say. Um, and I think it's helpful to look at collective memory um, by kind of taking it apart a bit by looking at two kind of core elements of it. Um, and so for me, um, one of the elements of collective memory that I think are, are really is really important is communicative memory. And whether you, you knew you were doing this or not, before this talk and indeed after it, um, you'll have been doing collective memory, you'll have been engaged in it. This is something we do kind of every day when you gossip with a neighbor or with a loved one, when you maybe give advice to, to someone or, or when you tell a joke. However, inadvertently by doing any of those things, you are um, maintaining, you are galvanizing the um, social uh, constraints and, and, and expectations of the communities in which you um, live in which we all live. Okay, so communicative memory then is something that is very much sort of shared or kind of knitted together by by individuals. Okay, and our normal, so you say normal as they are at the moment, but normal um, interactions. Alongside that, though, we have something that um, is referred to as cultural memory, and cultural memory is a little bit more kind of distant. Okay, and it's maybe thinking about art or different periods of art. 
It's maybe um, thinking about different styles of dress, which um, Tom spoke um, a little bit about. It's maybe thinking about events, key events in your nation's history or um, events within your community that might be commemorated in big anniversaries or something, or even proverbs or, 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 or language. Um, and if communicative memory is largely sort of shared by individuals, cultural memory is often something that we might associate with institutions. Okay, if we want to um, have a um, immersion in the art of the 20th century, we might go to a gallery. If we want to find out about particular events, we might go to a, a, a museum. Um, we also, of course, have institutions that protect our language or, or, or produce our uh, dictionaries, wherever it might be. So both of those things, I think, are going on all the time, communicative memory and cultural memory, which are shaping our collective memory. And I think what's interesting is, although that seems quite um, benign, um, and maybe again can be comforting. Of course, what they're both doing is establishing who within any group or community belongs and who within any community does not belong. And for me, this is where I think, you know, there is an important connection to um, dress because I think dress is often the kind of conduit for some of these ideas. What we wear, when we wear it, how we wear it, will all establish the degrees to which we understand the kind of cultural cues of our societies. So I suppose what I'm also suggesting is that there is a, a connection between cultural memory and, and, and culture more, um, more broadly. And this galvanizing role, I suppose, that a collective memory can have, particularly through, through dress and fashion, and, and maybe even a comforting role, um, was something that um, Anna Wintour um, spoke about um, in a interview that she did with The um, Economist. And when it comes to collective memory, possibly Anna Wintour is not necessarily um, a, a great sort of role model. Some of her comments about the lack of um, sort of diversity and inclusivity that have appeared within the, the pages of Vogue magazine under her, um, uh, her, her steer. Um, but I think the remarks that she makes in this interview are, are actually really kind of germane to our topic today. And I think really actually quite prescient because her comments were made in July, 2019. Um, so have a, um, a look, um, you can obviously find it online by typing in that, that title for the, the full podcast, which is about maybe um, half an hour or so. But I just want to play um, a short clip, um, far bit from me to, to speak for Anna Wintour. I think she can uh, speak for herself um, well enough. So hopefully that the sound will play, um, but if it doesn't, the text will also appear on the, the screen so you can read along. But I think this makes, I hope, a really um, important point about the, the role of, of collective memory and clothing um, and the way that it can provide a sense of psychological soul and, and, and nourishment. Um, so um, over to you, Anna. One big change I see right now, and particularly coming back from the collections as I, I, I just have done in, in Europe, is a sense that customers, CEOs, owners of big businesses are really searching for what fashion means today and how that there needs to be an, an emotional connection and that fashion cannot be seen as something that is in any way disposable, that women need to look at fashion as not only an investment from a personal point of view, but an investment in terms of clothes that they can wear again and again. This idea that you wear something once and then won't be seen in it again seems completely out of step with the times. And it really isn't about what the price is. You can find wonderful fashion at less expensive prices and wonderful fashion at insane prices, but I think it's much more about fashion, clothing, being emotional, something that you could give to your daughter or something you could give to your son as time goes by and it having really meaning and connection and reminding the wearer of moments in their life. And I think it's important that all of us who live in a world where everything is seen so visibly, so instantly um, by so many that maybe a sense of value and connection is, is, is very meaningful right now. 
And as I said, I think how, how prescient those remarks were made in July 2019, before I guess any of us had heard of the COVID-19 pandemic. So how much more um, relevant they, they seem today. And I just think you know, these phrases, these words that, that Wintour is, is talking about, about an emotional connection through our, our clothing, of it having value, of it speaking to us, um, and being something that we can um, have with us, as she says, at key moments in our life, a bit like that, that Mulberry advertisement that I, that I showed you at the, the outset. Um, Anna Wintour doesn't mention um, the phrase collective memory, but I think in, in talking about these connections and values, it, it's collective memory that I think we can see that she is um, alluding to. And this, as I said, is, is quite, quite positive, isn't it? The idea that collective memory can kind of galvanize us, maybe make us feel a little bit better at a time of um, disquiet. But as we've heard, things aren't quite that simple. The um, impact of the pandemic has been differential. Um, and also, of course, there is this paradox, which I think I'm very alive to as a, as a historian, that the fashion industry often does not engage with its past. Um, we know that heritage is often used in advertising campaigns and, and so on and so forth. But more broadly, I think there is a, um, a difficulty that the industry seems to have when it comes to the, um, the past and looking backwards. Um, and that for me, I thought was um, really striking, um, strikingly brought out when I read um, Andre Leontale's latest uh, memoir, The Chiffon Trenches, um, and he writes, fashion is not an industry that lives in the past, but rather carries its past along like a shadow wherever it goes. So this idea then that those, you know, collective memories, the past is kind of there, but it's in a box, a bit like Pandora's box that we, we don't want to open because we don't know what's going to come out. It's kind of inert. And I thought for me, that was really striking because Andre Leontali majored in, in history, a particular interest in, in French and, and art history. And that was very much his first sort of foray um, into the world of, of fashion. So interesting that he sort of doesn't engage more positively and, and purposefully with, with um, the past. Um, and also, I think just this morning, as the world is sort of waking up to the news of the passing of um, um, Elba Elbaz, um, this um, on um, social media, um, a quote from Elbaz, that fashion is just about today. So I think for me as the historian, that there's a sort of disconnect between perhaps the promise of um, collective memory that is offered by, by Wintour and the perhaps reality that we are aware of, that the fashion industry doesn't really engage um, systematically or in, in a convincing way with um, its past. Uh, and there was a question that was asked of, of, of Sam about cultural appropriation. Um, and, you know, the fashion industry is perhaps one of, rightly or wrongly, but one of the industries that is often um, accused of um, misdemeanors and cultural trespass because of, uh, of cultural appropriation, which is almost in some ways the antithesis of, uh, of collective memory. So I suppose for me that the question or the conundrum was then during a period, the period we're living through right now, where an engagement with the past and collective memories as we're grappling with the pandemic are becoming kind of more urgent. Um, how might it be that the industry can sort of seize the day and make um, Wintour's words um, kind of hold true and, and be realized um, effectively? And so I got to thinking more broadly about, about culture and what that means, because I think there is a, a strong connection between culture and um, collective memory. Um, I'm aware it's a Sunday, so I don't want to kind of overload too much with, with theory, but um, a book I've really found sort of helpful in thinking um, through issues of culture, and I think is, is reasonably accessible, um, is um, Homi Bhabha's book um, from 1994, The Location of, of Culture. And if there are any kind of Baba files here, um, I'm only going to offer a kind of short sort of pressy just for the purposes of, of, of time. My main, I suppose, intention is that I can kind of steer you to, to have a gander at this um, book in your 
in your own time. But very broadly then, and just to get us going, um, Baba is interested in culture as, as a process, something that is constantly evolving. Um, he's interested in the kind of cultural ideas and differences um, between, um, um, between cultures um, and, and, and their, their changing values. So he's not really interested in kind of cultural production and not really interested in kind of high and, and, and low culture, but more um, uh, interested in culture as, as an idea. And as I just alluded to there, I think a key element of, of Baba's thought is this idea of difference. And that might seem really counterintuitive um, as I said at the outset, if there's one thing, one thing we've learned from the pandemic, it's that it has exposed a huge range of um, inequalities around the world. So as we move forward, we'll try to move forward from that pandemic, we probably want less difference, not, not more. Um, so why do I think um, this, is, um, this is a useful concept? Well, hopefully um, I can explain. Um, because for, for Baba, when different cultures come together, when different ideas um, rub up against each other or, or sometimes collide, and that might be quite a violent um, collision, um, something interesting happens. Um, and he says that these moments um, or these occasions when different cultural ideas and values come together um, create spaces. And it's in these spaces um, that... Um, we have, and he says, opportunities for new signs of identity and innovative sites of collaboration and contestation in the act of defining the idea of society itself. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, let's take a kind of personal example. If you're watching something, if you're listening to something, if you're having a conversation with someone and they maybe say something or, or, or do something that, that challenges you, that you didn't expect, that you don't like, you might very well sort of take the view, well, you know, why am I responding negatively to this when my worldview might suggest I should respond positively or, or vice versa? Um, if something kind of, you know, hits you viscerally, I guess, you begin this process, don't you, kind of questioning, you know, what is it that I believe? This has kind of, you know, rocked my world. Um, what is it that I really sort of stand for? And it's in that process of questioning, that process of interrogation, because something different has come your way, that you begin to find kind of modes of um, acceptance, find modes of, of, of cooperation or, or collaboration you begin to kind of almost morph your thinking to make it, make it more flexible to alternative points of view. And so Baba would say that this therefore means and leads to the displacement of domains of difference. You don't get homogeneity, but you do, as I said, get a situation where you have a kind of modus operandi. You can live with and work productively and engagingly with people who have, or cultures that have different expressions of belief and, and, and different practices, okay? Um, and coming out of that is a really key concept in, um, in Baba's thought. And it's the concept of hybridity. And it's this idea that all of us are formed from a mixture of different cultures. All of our kind of ideas are kind of taken kind of piecemeal. We don't have um, these kind of hermetically sealed memories or these hermetically sealed cultures. We're all kind of formed from this kind of interwoven um, um, sort of tapestry of, of different cultural um, ideas. And we can access that, we can understand that more readily if we're more aware, more alive of there being difference and different opinions um, in the world around us. And, and this leads, I think, to something really, really exciting. Um, it's exciting for me and I, I hope it will be for you too. Um, because Baba says that once we kind of engage with this sense of, of, of difference and understand the complexity and the value of those differences, then we can, as he says here, redescribe our cultural contemporaneity, and that can enable us to reinscribe our human and our historic commonality. So that sense of commonality, that sense of collectiveness, but not homogeneity, 
okay? We come to that sense of inclusion by embracing people's differentness, by understanding that our collective memories might be in a sense collective, we've all shared them, but nonetheless, the experience will be different because of um, our backgrounds, our learning, our beliefs, etc. Et and I want to kind of explore this because I'm, I'm conscious that's um, quite general. I want to kind of trace it back to, to fashion and think about, as I said, a concept that was alluded to in the, the recent questions um, and think about cultural appropriation. This is where I think the fashion industry is often held most to account and where it's criticized um, because of its, its lack, I suppose, of cultural competency, um, its um, failure, perhaps, perceived failure to engage with, um, with collective memory and therefore collective memory, as I suggested, could be seen as something that is diametrically opposed to, to cultural appropriation. But is it? Um, and my steer here is a really interesting um, article that was written by Richard Rogers that appeared in this journal, um, Communication Theory. Um, and there's a strong connection, I think, between what um, Rogers argues and Baba's theory on, on culture. And so Rogers talks about cultural transmission, perhaps more so than, than appropriation. Appropriation, as we're probably all aware, has perhaps negative um, connotations. So Rogers talks about um, cultural transmission and he argues that there are essentially four types of cultural exchange that are, that are ongoing all of the time in our present, in our past and, and, and almost certainly in our future too. And very, very briefly, again, I urge you to, to access the article, but for our purposes, exchange, we're maybe thinking about cultural transmission that is maybe quite, quite equal there's a parity between the cultures. Um, with two and three, with domination and exploitation, as, as the name suggests, um, there's an unevenness where you have a kind of superordinate or dominant culture and a, a subordinate or, or, or lower culture. Um, the difference between dominance and exploitation will be the extent to which there's maybe violence um, involved in that transmission. And, and particularly with exploitation, we might, we might see that more. Um, but I think for me, what's particularly interesting is the fourth type of cultural transmission, which is transculturation. And you can see where in the brackets, um, Rogers has put these kind of negatives. So the degree of voluntariness or involuntariness, um, et cetera. Um, but essentially arguing in this paper and by breaking down cultural transmissions in this way, moving away from a binary of, of right or wrong, which is perhaps not so, not so helpful, enables us to see, and he suggests that culture, and I suppose I'm conflating a little bit culture and collective memory here, that culture is a relational phenomenon that is itself constituted by acts of appropriation. So cultural transmission is inevitable. It's always going on. Um, and I think if you focus on Roger's words there, that culture is a relational phenomenon, it's self-constituted by acts of appropriation. There's a kind of connection, isn't there, to what Baba was saying about, about hybridity. Um, and so again, by kind of acknowledging the differences between cultures, they're different um, collective um, experiences um, and, and memories and understanding how they all come together in a very kind of complex um, kind of woven kind of tapestry that that enables us to perhaps move away um, from ideas of, of nostalgia um, which might be kind of comforting and provide us with a warm glow but aren't necessarily um, helpful in terms of um, analyzing the, the role and, and impact of, of the past. And I suppose what I'm suggesting is that if we can have this more kind of frank and open and, and real engagement with the kind of messy, complicated way in which we learn and, 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 and um, develop ideas from, from other cultures and indeed other cultures' memories, um, then we can understand um, more actively and purposefully the role that collective memory has and, and why it's so important um, so to us. So by way then, I suppose, of just bringing some of the threads of this story um, together, I just want to make sort of three 
final uh, points. The first, I hope, is that I've been able to say a little bit in the time that I've had about the importance that collective memory has in helping us to sort of understand responses to um, fashionable um, dress, why it might be kind of particularly important now, as I said, at a time that we are um, emerging or beginning to emerge from the, the pandemic. And that despite the name, the phrase collective memory, perhaps sounding um, immutable and not relevant, I hope actually that we can maybe begin to see collective memory as something that is more dynamic and quite flexible and perhaps helps us to understand through fashionable dress, but um, other um, forms of cultural production as well, um, the role, the very active role that the past has in, in um, framing and informing our present and indeed future. And linked to that, I suppose, um, the idea that I've tried to suggest through linking to Baba and to a little bit um, Roger's work, that cohesion within a kind of community and, and culture is often stronger when it does embrace ideas of difference. Um, and that although that might on the face of it sound um, kind of counterfactual, counterintuitive, um, I hope we can kind of begin to see that collective doesn't mean, you know, homogeneous, that you can be collective and still acknowledge um, uh, different opinions and, and, and different um, values. And one point I haven't touched on, but this is, I suppose, is my um, um, final kind of remark and perhaps the true promise of um, understanding and, and grappling critically with um, collective memory by emphasizing difference and the difference of all cultures, we can perhaps begin to kind of drill down into what makes Western cultures distinctive. And by that, I mean move away from this idea where Western cultural norms are kind of seen as the litmus test, the so say standard by which other cultures are, are judged. I'm particularly persuaded by the work of Daniel Miller, who argues that it might actually be the West that is the weird one. Um, and that if we can begin to kind of think about difference and dislodge um, some of the um, socialized ideas of Western thought, um, that we might actually have a more purposeful um, engagement with differences that exist and also be more open to the collective memory of our own culture, but also of, of other cultures as well and see how they kind of engage and frame um, the fashion industry such that the engagement that we see with the past can be more kind of purposeful and we can move away from some of the sort of pernicious thought um, linked to kind of tribalism and, and polarization that we're increasingly finding in rhetoric within politics, but within society more broadly um, around the world um, today. So kind of lots to think about um, there that I'm kind of putting your way, as I said, on, on, on a Sunday. Um, but as ever, if you've got questions, then um, I'll, I'll happily take them now, or um, by all means kind of contact me afterwards. Um, and um, I can address your questions there. So thank you for um, your time and I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing now.